So we are going to begin. Um, it's so great to have everyone here joining us this afternoon. Uh, thank you for for those in the West Coast. It's uh, it's morning, and for those who are in Europe, it is evening. So glad to have so many people here from all over. I have a few more people who are entering waiting room. I just ask that for anyone that is for anyone that is not any of the five speakers, including myself, if you could please just mute yourselves and remute it, that would be wonderful. And I urge everyone with any questions to please go ahead and also do enter your questions into the chat box there. You can ask questions also, uh, and we will be happy to address them to the, to the speakers and to answer them. So Today, we're here to discuss a really, really important issue. It's something that's gotten many headlines in the news, not always um, for the, 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 in the most positive sense. I, I think everyone here uh, has worked with and in the media uh, in some capacity long enough to realize that everything that's said and reported on isn't exactly accurate. And there's much more uh, behind the scenes that in investigatively needs to be done to uncover what the reality is in the ground, particularly in this case, um, with the groundbreaking of the Ram Temple in Ayodhya. So I just want to make sure I have, okay, there we go. Just mute it there. So <clears throat> the construction of the Ram Temple in Ayodhya, India stands not just as a monumental event in the country's religious and cultural landscape, but it's also a pivotal moment with far-reaching geopolitical implications for the Indo-Pacific region and beyond. So today's engaging discussion is going to aim to explore the profound significance of the Ramayana. It's an epic which everyone here is familiar with that has left an indelible mark on the cultural fabric of numerous societies across the Indo-Pacific, across Asia and across the West, you know, by examining the geopolitical ramifications that are stemming from the Ram Mandir's construction, uh, the event today seeks to offer, you know, more of an insightful perspective into the complex interplay between culture and politics that we're all witnessing here. Um, everyone who is participating here can expect to gain a deeper understanding of the dynamics at play and to understand and appreciate better the nuanced kind of role of, of how ancient narratives continue to shape the modern geopolitical realities and the dialogue that we're seeing. So it's going to be a very thought-provoking conversation, and you're going to hear a lot from our speakers today that you definitely, probably, and most likely wouldn't hear anywhere else. And that's an amazing thing and one of the things that we pride ourselves with here at the Gold Institute for International Strategy. With that, I would love to first, I know we have many more people who have joined our, our room. If you could please just make sure everyone is muted and uh, to ensure a more smooth ride for this uh, next hour or so. I'm gonna start off with introducing our speakers today. I'm really, really excited to have a really powerful, awesome, diverse, brilliant audience with us. And I'm going to allow for everyone to make an, about a one to two minute introduction about themselves, their backgrounds. And I will start off with Charlotte. Charlotte Littlewood. Oh. Hi. Okay. Hi. Um, my name is Charlotte. Um, my background is in counterterrorism and counter extremism with the UK government. I worked in prevent and then counter extremism, which is both of our preventative uh, de-radicalization strategies to try and stop uh, those who are vulnerable from becoming radicalized in the first place. Um, and then I moved on to working in research, academia, and doing my PhD at the University of Exeter. I've worked for the think tank, the Henry Jackson Society, and I'm working for a think tank, the International Center for Sustainability. And I spent two years on and off uh, living in the West Bank in Palestine, working with, with women there just before COVID. Incredible. You and I have that in common also. We worked at the Henry Jackson Society at different times. That's fantastic. I'd like next to go to Utsav Chakrabarti. Hello and namaste. Um, I have been the executive director of Hindu Action, which is an advocacy group based in the United States. 
primarily uh, focused in DC politics, uh, beltway politics and geopolitics surrounding it. Uh, I have been an architect by profession for the last 26 years, but also for the last 26 years, I have been uh, an advocate for human rights and, and uh, indigenous community rights. So that's my background. Hello, everybody. Wonderful, welcome. And I'd like now to go to Sehun Kim. Hi, uh, namaste. Thank you for uh, this opportunity. Um, thank you, Adele, uh, for also putting th this together with the Gold Institute. Uh, my name is Sehun Kim. I am currently uh, working uh, for a publication called the Global Stratview. Uh, I'm serve currently serving as the senior correspondent for East and South Asian Affairs and also as an assignment editor. And uh, this uh, this issue has been in our minds uh, for some time now, and I'm very, very excited to talk about it today and um, and also engaging with all of our uh, great panelists. Thank you. Awesome. And I'd like now to go to Shantanu Gupta. Uh, Namaskar, everyone, and Jai Shri Ram. Uh, I'm Shantanu, calling from all of you from India, Bharat. Uh, currently, I'm an author and a TV panelist. I'm biographer of UP Chief Minister Yogi Atanath. And I'm observing Ayodhya from last many years, fortunate to be there on that day. So waiting to share my views uh, with all of you and the audience. Incredible. You know, I, I thank you everyone for your brief and concise introductions. Love it. I would like to start with the questions now with Shantanu. You know, you had told me that you were actually at the groundbreaking. Mm -hmm of the Ayodhya, Ayodhya Ram Temple. Um, you've done several podcast episodes also on your experience there. I believe they were predominantly in the Hindi language. Can you tell our audience a little bit more about this, your experience there, and you know any interesting tidbits that weren't necessarily covered by the mainstream or legacy media? Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, uh, I'm one of those fortunate ones who was in Ayodhya that day. Uh, not only that day, I was there for almost five days. So the event happened on 26th of January, and I was there, landed there on 19th. And I still remember when I when I started my journey uh, from Delhi, and now there has an airport, so you can take a take a flight there. First time I saw people taking selfie with their boarding cards, with the display of Ayodhya written as an international station on the displays of the Delhi airport. When we landed at Delhi airport, people were not willing to go out of the Ayodhya airport, right? Because they were touching the, the land, the base of the airport, right? And when I entered Ayodhya and spent those two, three days before even the Pran Pratishtha happened, the, the consecration happened, there were like millions and millions of people on the road. And I asked many of them, like, will you be able to see the temple? Do you think in this crowd? They say, we don't mind. We are in this land. That's enough. This is the land where Rama might have walked. Rama walked in this land and just to be here in the presence of that 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 environment is enough uh, for us right and that day uh, when we saw the 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 idol of Rama right you can't control yourself right your emotions will just ooze out because I was one of those who were coming to Ayodhya from last six seven years right and it was such a painful experience to see Ram Lala or the statue this tiny statue intent from so many years and you will think in Rama's country in a Sanatani country in a Hindu country Rama has to survive in a tent right it's it's a, it was like a blemish on all of us as a civilization and that day the blemish was gone right and one more incident with this I'll end uh, that day when the thing was happening uh, there was a helicopter going around the state government has uh, done an arrangement and was throwing rose petals on the Ram Bhakts right the Ra Rama disciples and I was juxtaposing that, and I was standing next to Saryu, the river. I was juxtaposing that in 1990, a lot of Ram, Ram Sevaks, the Kar Sevaks, got, got, got shot in their, their heads, right? And the Saryu was red with the blood. Today, Saryu was red again, but with the flower petals, not the blood of the Ram Sevaks. So it was a huge juxtaposition that I saw. And people came cycling, people came skating from thousands and thousands of kilometers for multiple days. People came walking, right? And we had some people who had the invitation and political reasons, they never came. So uh, I'm a student of Ramayana and Ramayana happened in Treta and today is Kaliug. That day, the what I saw in Ayodhya, it was looking like as if the the, the time of Treta came in Kaliug. So that was yeah my experience in those five days in Ayodhya. 
That's amazing. You know, that's, it's something different. I've, I've been to India. I think everyone here, uh, I believe has been um, to India and there is something very magical. You know, I have, I have a similar feeling when in, in Africa, it's, but India in particular, there is, uh, I don't know, there's some kind of energy you feel that resonates, right? And that probably was intensified and amplified when you were there for this very historic uh, groundbreaking of the Ram Mandir. So that said, I really, I wanted to dive a little bit more into what this perhaps is going to cause, the cause and effect, right? Being that this is such a monumental, groundbreaking, historic, you know, event, occurrence in uh, South Asia, do you foresee a desire to rebuild historical Hindu temples in countries like Bangladesh, Cambodia, Laos, and Vietnam, where there are also significant Hindu populations? And there is obviously the historic, historically, um, the Ramayana also has been ever present and it plays an important role. Do you, do you foresee similar situations happening in countries like those as a result of this? event in India? I think exactly, exactly. And I think what happened exactly almost one month after the 22nd consecration is the 14th February opening of the uh, temple in UAE, in Abu Dhabi, right? That's also, that should not uh, pass by, right? That in Islamic country, where a couple of years back, in many Islamic countries, you can't travel with a Hindu text. I'm sure in Saudi Arabia, you can't land with a Hindu text on the airport, right? Uh, and now there is a grand, grand temple in UAE and Prime Minister of India flies there and, and inaugurates it, right? Uh, I'm sure many such movements will start. And as you rightly said, the places like Bangladesh, which has, to my understanding, 14 to 15 million Hindus, right? It's still, after after so many atrocities, it started with almost 20, 20% when uh, India got liberated. And it's it's today 8-9%. But even that 8-9% is almost 14-15 billion. And as you said, countries like Cambodia, Laos, and many others, right? Uh, countries like Thailand, they, they have a huge Hindu mark. They have a they have a city called Ayodhya. Their kings are called Rama, uh, the Rama one, Rama two. Current kings called Rama ten, Rama the tenth. Even Islamic country like Indonesia has its own Ramayana, which is called Kakavin Ramayana. And mm -hmm. now now there's an automatic surge in demand for the places of worship uh, there, and it will it will only grow from here, I think. And as you said the overturn window of engagement with our religion have changed that day. That day, it was become very natural to sing a Ram Bhajan inside a plane. It was become very natural. Uh, a, a air hostess greeting a Jai Shri Ram or a pilot saying Jai Shri Ram became very normal, which should have been a war cry a week back, right? So engaging for Hindus, engaging with their religion, and the Overton window has shifted drastically on that particular day, and it'll here to stay. Now, so that's a change that will happen. Yeah. Interesting. So that's great. Thank you for that perspective. I want to shift a little bit focus across, you know, across the, the Atlantic and many oceans to, to Charlotte now. I'd like to talk to you about, there's been really a backlash, a very negative kind of reaction in the media to the construction of this temple. Um, I think that everyone here has been following and can see a marked rise in targeted harassment, the, tar the targeting of you know, Indians, Hindus across the Western countries as well. And I want to shift to the to the UK, right? Um, this has caused the media to focus extremely heavily on kind of the age old battle between the Hindus and and Islamists, right? And it's it's sort of this, you know, the the, the axis of, you know, the red green axis against, you know, the other side, it's been going on for over a decade, as long as we can recall, it's not longer. Um, Charlotte, I want to see if you foresee any increase in attacks on British Hindus, for example, by Islamists in the UK, considering the extreme reaction that has been uh, given by those yeah. in the UK covering it. Yeah, so I think I think absolutely. I want to move on to that question. I've I've I don't know if we are supposed to be debating here <laughs> but I do I do feel like I want to pick, pick up on something that I'm a little bit nervous about with the, my experience in, in India and time in India and is this potential narrative that there is 
going to be a resurgence or a surge in claims for religious sites um, all over India and further afield. I do think that Ayodhya is a particularly unique situation in which this is a place of huge religious significance and the Supreme Court found that there was a consistent um, attachment or possession if you will especially of the outside courtyard where Hindus continue to pray and 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 have pilgrimage to that to that space and um, that caused the Supreme Court to rule in favor of the Hindus and their possessory rights but it really is a symbol of peace and harmony moving out of um, a huge period of destruction and thousands of lives lost. And this is a way to step forward and move forward together as communities. But I do worry if there, if this is seen as um, encouraging a claim on religious buildings all over various countries saying that there may be temples there once before, that we, we then may, may then move from what is a peaceful um, closing of a difficult chapter and opening of peace to something more troubling. So I did, I did want to say that. Um, but I, inversely, in the UK, we are seeing Hindus held accountable for perceived negative politics in India. So whatever the reality is, there's a perception that it's very negative, and that is being taken out on Hindus. And that is what we saw in 2022 in Leicester. Um, we saw attacks on Hindus' homes, vehicles, people physically attacked, stabbed, on account of being branded Hindutva, uh, BJP, RSS. And now, first of all, there is nothing wrong with BJP support in the UK. In fact, the majority of our Hindus in the UK support the BJP. But second of all, you, you cannot hold people accountable for politics abroad or even their politics is similar to what we're seeing with the Jewish community on account of Israel and, and Zionism and, and account the majority of Zionist as well. So I think there is there is a skewing and misinformation around BJP, and then there is an attack on Hindus who may or may not even have anything to do with the BJP, and and I do see this as similar to anti-Semitism. It does concern me. The NCRI, which is another think tank to the one that I I work with, that uh, I think it's based in Canada or the states, also looked at the unrest um, at a similar time as I was looking at the unrest in Leicester and did predict that in coming months, as we turn towards the elections in India, we will see a potential replica of the violence that we saw in Leicester. So that really is something we're concerned about. Um, I'm not sure if the audience knows, I also did a report on Hindu hate in schools, and we found that 10% of parents that describe the kind of bullying their uh, Hindu child was facing, 10% of those cases could be labelled as bullying on account of politics uh, in India. So it is definitely something that we're even seeing at, at a very young age as well, not just the attacks in Leicester. So there is real reason to have concern. Although when um, the Ram Temple was consecrated, we didn't see any pushback, but they were very dis uh, distracted actually at that time. And Shaquille Asfar, the lead agitator in the protests in Birmingham at the same time as the Leicester unrest against the Hindu community, Shaquille on the weekend of the consecration uh, was chanting from the river to the sea. So I think that the Islamists right now are looking towards Gaza, but surely if they weren't so distracted, they would be continuing their campaign against Hindus. You know, you made a very, first of all, thank you for all those points. I want to also note that there has been a marked rise, a significant rise in targeted uh, attacks against Hindus across in the UK, obviously, which you pointed out, um, in the United States. And, you know, something I just want to point out to, to the audience, everyone here, is that it's very important that despite the fact that it's such an emotional and, and heart, you know, heart-wrenching situation to experience, um, you have to be mindful and careful. When instances like there were seven Hindu students, for example, in the US, I believe, who died of either one was suicide, another one was of hypothermia, another one has a toxicology report awaiting, um, and, and another one, you know, a few others were, uh, another one was murdered by a, a vagrant that out of the goodness of his heart he took in. Um, some people are going around and for example, it doesn't help the cause when people are going and spreading information saying that these individuals, all oh, those Hindu kids were being targeted because they're Hindu faith. That actually is like crying wolf in a sense. And it's like going and, and actually 
delegitimizing and, and diminishing the fact that there is an actual attack on Hindus. So I've been seeing a lot, some of that from some, some members of the, you know, Hindu community. And I want to say that it, it's, it's, it's really important that the majority of course doesn't say that, but to, we've to not know seen that in the UK, yeah. we, we, quite the opposite the Hindu community are quite retreating and wanting to talk about their victimization. And um, in part, when I, when I did the study at the Hindu hate at schools, I asked about why, they weren't so forthcoming in in talking about discrimination and there was an element of like karmic thinking that this is not something that they should deal with but that will come back full circle on on the um the the, the people perpetrating the discrimination and and that it wasn't for them to make a fuss um in in fact we're having more of a difficulty encouraging the hindu community to stand up for themselves rather than the, the other way around it's really good that you're encouraging that. And uh, I, I absolutely see culturally why it's it's more passive when it comes to that stuff. So it's good that you're doing that. Happy to discuss that with you more too. Um, I'm going to get back to to kind of the comparison you made in, in a second. I want to jump over to Utsav for a second as well. Um, I, I want to ask if, you know, similarly how Charlotte answered if she thinks there's going to be any increase or a rise on attacks in Hindus by Islamists in the UK, uh, in in you know British Hindus specifically. Do you uh, would suffer see attacks on um, Hindus by you know Islamists in the US and Canada? Well, there has already been quite a bit of uh, increase in the month of January uh, in terms of targeting uh, at least the documented ones. Uh, there has been quite a bit of increase. So just to you know step back a little and understand why this is happening, you know in the short and midterm you will see a hostile response from anti-Hindu forces, uh, especially the alliance between Islamists, Khalistanis, and and the extreme left or the whatever left we would want to call them, uh, because th their interests are aligned and anything that legitimizes Hindus in India and around the world causes problem. To their interests, so they, it's it's a pure clash of interests, and therefore this this is the rise that is you are going to see. Now, in the month of January itself, we had seven Hindu temples that were uh, desecrated in the state of California, uh, and two more in December. So that was literally the window of one month period that was prior to the opening of the Ram Temple in Ayodhya. So I do believe that there is a correlation between that. And uh, you know, just last week uh, there was a seminary in Sh Chicago near near Chicago where an Islamic scholar actually went on and rebuked the leadership of UAE uh, for uh, for for doing the temple in in uh, Abu Dhabi. And I was like, good luck traveling in Emirates after that. But anyway, uh, this is this is something that is going to be happening across in America. It is already happening. You will see uh, unification of these elements because. The weaker they get within the Indian subcontinent, the stronger they will be putting their resources in the Western world or anywhere else where they can put their resources together. And they are very organized. So this has to be analyzed from the perspective that there is central, if not central, at least some sort of distributed nodal uh, decision-making process amongst these elements, which are quite coordinated. So I do believe that in the medium term and, and short term, there will be a rise in anti-Hindu crimes, uh, we will see that. In the long term, I think uh, this will be a positive step. The, the Ram Temple in Ayodhya will be a positive step because more and more people around the world will see the Hindus in a post through a post-colonial lens. Uh, you know, there has been a tendency across the world to look at Hindus through the lens of the Mughals, who were who didn't consider themselves Indian for most of their rule. They were there's a tendency to do, do look at India through the lens of the Western outsider. And that was the lens that was prevalent all these uh, all these decades. Now there will be a more a balanced view, I think. And I think that will be good for all of us, and not just the people of Hindu background, but the entire world. It's good to understand people from all the perspectives. Absolutely. You know, speaking of this rise in anti-Hindu sentiment, right, throughout Europe, throughout the West, uh, I want to Go over now to Sehun, Sehun Kim. How does this, of course, the Ramayana has tremendous roots in all of Asia, right? Indo-Pacific and beyond. And specifically, I'd like to know how you think that this 
global phenomenon, which has become the, you know, the reconstruction and the grand opening of the um, Ram Mandir in Ayodhya. How does this impact China and the rest of Asia? Well, thank you for that question. And I think that question is extremely timely for uh, the times that we're living in right now. And I, I'll tell you the reason why it's very simple. You know, the current regime in China, which has been in power since the late forties um, and even even way beyond, way before that, um, they have been focused on one thing within Asia, which is to change the narrative from the Western or worldly narrative to the Beijing-centered narrative. So anything that goes within Asia, <clears throat> with their, pardon me, their. Uh, their ultimate goal is to get it run by, you know, the, the folks who are running things in Beijing. And, and, and you might be asking, okay, well, what does the opening of the Raman deal have anything to do with that? It has, to, it has a lot to do with it because number one, um, the, everything that's associated with the Raman deer, the history, the culture, I mean, the societal impact that it had for thousands of years um, has a lot more of a deeper root all over Asia than what the, the CCP has done in the last uh, few decades, of course. And that, and, and, and that, that log logically makes more sense, right? But, it, but in another sense, it's also making them extremely nervous because they're realizing that the stories like the Ramayana or the culture that has the cultures that have affected places like Indonesia, the biggest Muslim country in the world, by the way, right, um, is really uniting everyone together in 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 this in, in this one temple. So it, it shifted from the Beijing focused in narrative to now the Ram Mandir or Ayodhya centered uh, narrative that I, all, all, all folks are actually naturally you know falling into rather than through money or. Uh, constant business or even military action, right? Which is something that we've seen, uh, you know, continuously in the last uh, few years in, in the South China Sea. <clears throat> so in a sense, you know, the Chinese have been engaged in, in such a, a in such an aggression um, to a point where a lot of the Southeast Asian countries are looking for an alternative. And I think India is becoming that, that, that alternative that they're, they're looking for. It's not exactly the West. It's not definitely not China, but it's something that they're uh, connected to. I mean, you have to remember a lot of these civilizations wouldn't exist without Sanskrit, without the, uh, you know, without the, uh, the scholars, the Buddhist and the Hindu scholars, that has traveled to these areas, right? And, and, and you know, it, it even extends to places like the Philippines, uh, you know, for example. And, and, you know, it's, although it is a predominantly a Catholic country, a lot of, even some of the customs that are remaining today in some of the tribes within the Philippines, it's driven from uh, Hindu, you know, culture. Um, and, and, you know, even just going to my old, my, my, my homeland, uh, Korea, um, it's impacted individuals like myself who actually uh, share a heritage, a literal heritage in a place like um, Ayodhya. Uh, short story, um, there is a very famous legend in Korea where a, a princess from Ayodhya received a revelation from a very heavenly being uh, to travel to a foreign land to meet her husband. And her husband ended up becoming the, uh, becoming the emperor of Southern Gaia Kingdom, which is where I am from, uh, Busan in Korea. Uh, today and, and and so it has invoked in a sense this whole parat that has been hidden inside all of us and maybe for indonesians it's uh you know it's it's the it's the cultural uh you know background that they have or even some of the um the the religious uh, impact that it had in place like Myanmar or even uh, cambodia and it has also invoked um this uh this reminder to see how how much we're connected you know through folks like myself that has literal uh, you know connection there um, and, and so the impact is huge and I think the the Ram Mandir temple with the opening of the Ram Mandir temple in a sense um, it, it really shouldn't also be looked upon as a religious uh, you know issue it, it really is not because it's it's something that everybody uh, every country uh, that has um, majority Christian to majority Muslims um, can relate to because it is their heritage, like it or not, right? And so, um, you know, it's 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 naturally connected uh, everybody together, uh, probably for the first time in a very long time all over Asia. And you know, it's I I, I don't want to just call I don't want to just call it an Indian operation, but it really, in a sense, it's become everyone's um, operation together uh, for the sake of unity. Um, 
in that part of the region. So uh, the, the the Chinese narrative that's been there is it's, it's slowly fading, but in a, but in a more of a natural sense. So it's it's really interesting to see, and I think it's only going to grow from this point. This is this is really great. I was going to actually go to you next, Shantanu. <laughs> I was going to I was going to say that uh, a lot of people who embrace you know Hinduism they don't see it as a religion per se. They see it as a way of a life more of a moral philosophy or a spiritual guiding principle um shantan i'd love for you to respond to what Stephen said i yeah, just want to just want to share some thoughts what on kim and charlotte said so when kim said about the connection with the korean uh korean ayodhya connection a uh, lot of us realized in 2018 when the first lady of korea became the chief guest for a big event in ayodhya uh, so every Deepavali, every, uh, day before Deepavali, from last seven years, a lot of, lot of real earthen lamps are being lit, right? It's called Deepotsa. And uh, Ayodhya, which was considered like a disputed town a couple of years back, now has claimed almost seven or eight guineas book of world record, right? Last time, I think some, some 2 million, 2.2 million uh, lamps were lit, right? And in one such event, the first lady of Korea came and she herself told the Korea connection of Ayodhya that how... Uh, when went there, a lot of people in Korea consider themselves like a the descendants from that queen, right? So that's one. Uh, the Ramayana ballets in Southeast Asia uh, have their own significance, like Ramayana ballets in, in Indonesia, in, in Thailand, in Philippines, and they all the Ramayana ballet troops came to Ayodhya during the event and they performed. They're coming from um, last last seven, eight years, right? That's one. When I think Charlotte said about other temples. So there are a lot of legitimate demands of other temples and they should be pursued, right? It's almost like, like someone has taken my land, I have to take it back, right? And there are cases going on in the Kashi temple. There are cases going on in the courts of law. I'm saying there's no street violence in the courts of law with legitimate documents. And some cases are so blatant, like if you just pick up any farman of Aurangzeb, it's written, okay, go ahead, date by date. This day, go and break the temple. After the, the army comes back and reports back, okay, the temple is being broken, mosque is being built, and the and the idols of the temple are in the footsteps of the mosque, right? This is very documented, even in Arabic text and Farsi text, right? Yeah, so I mean, those temples should be legitimately claimed back, right? There should be no qualms about that. That's one. Second thing, I think the how uh, the foreign media reported uh, the BBC particularly that a controversial temple is inaugurated by Narendra Modi, and lot of the disputed temples being launched by Narendra Modi. And I was very happy when in UK Parliament, uh, if I remember the name correctly, Bob Blackman, the, the British MP, and he, he, he said, like, why BBC is reporting like this? It's a phenomena that, that should be praised. And so that's also from both the sides, right? Um, I'm a scholar of Ramayana, and Ramayana has a global, global presence. I was reading that big, fat biography of Barack Obama, and he mentions that I take inspiration from Ramayana and Mahabharata, right? Like a... Hard close liberal it's taking inspiration from Ramayana. So yeah, I thought I'd just share thoughts on the thoughts of my panelists here. Thank you for that. You know, I just want to read some of the headlines. Um, I'm going to read the publications are from too. Uh, just a few of them, okay, surrounding the way they covered the Ayodhya temple. Uh, the Guardian, Ayodhya, Modi hails, quote, dawn of new era as work on controversial temple begins. That was before, obviously, it was, uh, that was back in 2020. Um, from the BBC News, uh, August 2020 also, Indian PM Modi lays foundation for Ayodhya Ram Temple amid COVID surge. I have a picture of him, of course, uh, with his mask on. And uh, science shows that, you know, masks don't really work, but that's a whole different topic. Uh, then you have CNN, which in, it was more recent, Modi's, quote, divine India vision threatens to marginalize millions. And I, I just want to read an excerpt from that. Modi's vision of a divine India is a far cry from the ideas of the modern country's founding fathers. During nearly a decade in power, the prime minister has enveloped himself in the language of religion in pursuit of his Hindu nationalist agenda, isolating millions among India's sizable religious minorities. I mean, that's, that in and of itself is interesting because 
the religious minorities you're referring to are in no way, shape, or form a minority as far as I know. I don't think the Muslim population, for example, is a minority population in India. I don't think the Christian population is a minority population. We're talking about millions or tens of millions of people there um, with uh, strong, very strong. And one last one I want to read is the Washington Post. On global opinions, of course, I want to say this one is a Marxist opinion, of course. Um, India marks another day of erasure and insult against its Muslim citizens. And I think that's been really where the focus has been. You know what I mean? On the fact that the there's been attacks on, you know, on, on Muslims in India at the day that the, the mandir, the temple was put, opened uh, for the public. And I, I think I don't know. I mean, Shantanu, you, you were there yourself. Um, Utsov, you, you were there recently. Uh, I, I'd i love to get a reaction from either of you two, from everyone else here, about is the media really casting this whole uh, attack on the minority Muslim population accurately? Are they really being target i mean first of all i just want to preface that by saying that no no one regardless of what their faith is should be targeted and attacked just on the basis of their faith that's wrong um but the way that the media is portraying this is it really as accurate as what's happening on the ground and is it really a, a big widespread issue or is it a few you know bad members of society that are deciding to carry out vagrant acts and ruin it for the for the majority I just yeah. wanted to say something about it. See, uh, I was in India during the month when this temple was being inaugurated and I was following the news about there were some reports of some violence. So I really thought about it. Like India is a country of 1.4 billion people. And the number of people in the last two months or three months who were affected uh, through, uh, again, I want to say no violence between anybody is acceptable. But mm -hmm. the amount and the, and the scale of violence that happened in the country of 1.4 billion people during this entire three months period coming up to the Ayodhya Mandir was less than a weekend's worth of violence in the city of Chicago. And, uh, and, and that's something I believe the Washington Post opinion writer should have considered, or probably they don't want to consider in their reporting. Like, you know, I'm not trying to do a, a comparison here, I, which I'm doing and ending up doing, but people have to look at things logically for them to be taken seriously. And I think this is a good way to present it just to make people understand the the scale of things and the scale of the country that India is. I just want to add a, a tiny point. The way the Ayodhya issue was solved, I think we should salute to the Indian judiciary that with a five judge bench, and there are layers and layers of proof, right? I'm currently studying that thousand page judgment. It has historical document. It has British gazette, gazettes. It has archeological evidence. And it has a lot of spiritual evidence from both the sides, right? After that, it's still um, the area of Jerusalem is a disputed place and all the three legions are fighting for it, right? This is the, yes. this should be a classic case study how a 500 year old case can be solved by judiciary. That's a very technical verdict. And it should be a case study in every college, every law college in the world. And it's sort of like Hindu took back their land by a legitimate uh, procedure of law. So that's one. And when the case came in 2019, in November, December, as Utsav said, nothing big happened. Nothing big happened, right? Like, as you, as you said, like, in a weekend in Chicago, there might be more, more, more shootouts, right? And when the temple the consecration and the month building to that, nothing major happened, right? In fact, one of the parties, the Muslim parties, who was there uh, 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 in the court, he was attending the ceremony, right? Iqbal Ansari. Right. So, so uh, uh, a lot of these people who report from New York and London, they have never even traveled to India, let alone Ayodhya or Lucknow, right? So <laughs> you, can, you can see what kind of reporting they're doing. You know, I want to just touch on that. Charlotte, you and I spoke about this briefly on the phone, right? We, we spoke about the, the fact that the, the law, the judiciary, right, the way that the constitution of India is structured, which is secular, uh, and the way that the judiciary was ruling on, on this reaction to, frankly, they don't, they don't even need to react to the media anyway, because there is, there's no basis and proof for the fact that people are reporting that there's, uh, you know, munders being built over mosques, uh, masjids, so no, it's not what's happening, but you specifically pointed out that the law states that 
no, there's no basis to to do, carry out those kinds of acts, and that India doesn't have any intentions, or for that part, in other parts of the world, right, to actually build, destroy already existing, you know, religious structures and replace them with munders. Um, so are you talking about that. the Supreme Court judgment in itself? Or does the Supreme Court judgment in it in itself didn't speak to further claims? I don't think I've I've seen a speech from the chief of the RSS who talked about how Hindus should not now be going to look for shivlas under every mosque, um, and there is I guess different rhetorics um, around this. My my hope would be that unless there is a temple of particular religious significance and the the ram temple is akin to the birth of christ in bethlehem and the church that's built there for christians or mecca for muslims um and it's somewhere that has been pil there have been pilgrimages to it that has been held in the the consciousness of of hindus um, and, and beyond that Dharmic faith, be wider than that, within this broader consciousness um, for hundreds and hundreds, thousands even, uh, of years. So it is a very particular and special claim. If you go down a route of removing every religious building that is built upon another religious building, we will be getting rid of cathedrals in the UK, the Notre Dame in France, um, that are built on top of pagan sites. It's It was a civilizational strategy of dominance to build your religious site on top of the religious site of this, the conquered communities. Um, that's been the same for every conquering civilization age old. Now, if India seeks to replace all mosques with Hindu temples, wherever they may find any evidence of a temple, then they are only doing what conquering civilizations have done forever. Um, and this is this is not useful. What would be very useful is what we have just seen with Ayodhya, you know, following the court case, a court case that has to find a continued worship, a continued possessory right. Now, a lot of these temples that are under mosques have been forgotten and not religiously significant. There are other places of worship nearby. Therefore, they won't, they won't meet the, the standards. So go ahead, send the cases to the Supreme Court, waste the Supreme Court's time when what we should be doing is building coexistence um, within secular India. Thank you. Sure. Sehun, please. I think it's also really important to realize that there is a very malicious campaign against India going, you know, yeah. going on. And it's it's extremely important to, to point that out. And for us to understand it, because the one of the campaigns that they're trying to do is to make the entire history of India look like um, something that should be uh, looked upon as malicious. And I'll tell you the reason why, you know, this this whole conquering of th this whole narrative that they've built on um, and whoever it may be. Um, that that Hindus that all Hindus are trying to destroy X Y and Z and this is just how they have always been and and etc cetera, etc. Cetera. Well, you know you have to remember India is the only country that's uh, this subcontinent actually it's the only place where anti-Semitism didn't grow right as as much as it did in other places. Matter of fact, anti-Semitism was virtually non-existent uh, in India. That's that's why the that's why the Jewish population was able to just literally thrive and live like everybody else, um, uh, you know, around their surroundings. And also at the same time, you know, Parsis, right, when they first uh, arrived in, to India, it, they, uh, I, I, when, when even the king said, well, we don't have enough space for all of you, what can you contribute? They actually uh, added in uh, sugar in, uh, on the milk and said, you know, this is as, as, as sweet as we made this to be, we can, we can enrich uh, the, the civilization. And they actually did. Um, you know, Christians also have uh, thrived there. And also, let's let's not forget the population of Muslims in India has grown up to 30 percent of its entire population right now since partition. So no one can really accuse India of uh, doing genocide against Muslims or any other groups for that matter. Right? So, um, right. Absolutely. And, and so and so that's something that we, we should we should keep in mind. And, you know, on, on the last note, uh, you know, while and it seems like the only ones who are not happy about this are people within 
particularly people within India that are against the against the BJP. Everybody else around the surrounding nations of India um, are really looking forward to it. We just had an event, um, a matter of fact, in Congress about uh, less than a month ago regarding uh, the Ramayana. And ambassadors from multiple nations came, including the ambassador of Thailand, who actually really delved into Thailand's shared heritage with the Indian civilization and how much impact the Ramayana had. So for everybody else, it's a reason to celebrate. And I really, really hope that people within uh, India realize that, you know, it's it, it's it's there is a greater picture than what they see uh, in the media and that. And I and personally, I personally wouldn't worry about what the Western media would uh, would say about this uh, at, at all, because, you know, at the end, you know, if if the narrative is to be changed within Asia, it's always going to look favorably towards India anyways. And that's bound to happen. And, and I think I think time would only tell. You know, I want to also add to that. Thank you for that. One of our one of our participants, Kiran Rajaya, uh, he asked a question. He goes, why is the media not saying that five acres of land has been allocated for the mosque and the Muslims of Ayodhya also support the building of the temple? Yeah, in case anyone doesn't know here, it was in 2020, I believe, where the Uttar Pradesh cabinet had cleared a proposal to give the Uttar Pradesh Sunni Central Waqf Board, a five-acre plot allocated 25 kilometers from the Ram Janmabhumi site to build a mosque, uh, which is actually located at Danipur village. So um, the, it's it's very interesting. He's, he's very at, right to point that out. Um, that hasn't been at all highlighted. It's, it's just one-sided misinformation against one religious group, which happens to be in the majority in India, of course. Um, I don't know if anyone wants to respond to that, but I would also like to say that he has another question. Um, this the same participant he wants to know with Ayodhya done, what kind of lies and backlash should we expect and be prepared for uh, when it comes to Gyanvapi and Mathura? And for anyone who doesn't know, uh, Gyanvapi is located in uh, Varanasi in Uttar Pradesh. Um, the term translates to the well of knowledge, and the site is known for the Gyanvapi Mosque, which was said to have been built by the Mughal Emperor um, Oranz, Oran, Oranz. I'm sorry, Oranz, Oranz. 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 century. Thank you for that. <laughs> after after demolishing a Hindu, Hindu temple, um, and it is this particular masjid is adjacent to the Kashi Vishwan Temple, um, which is very revered, and Mathura is also in Uttar Pradesh. It is one of Hinduism's seven sacred cities, and it is also revered as the birthplace of Lord Krishna. Uh, and it's also, it's located the city on the Yamuna River, and it has a rich history, of course, that dates back to ancient times. So I, I wanted to get your everyone's reaction here to his questions. What, what should be expected in these two very sacred, uh, you know, Indian locations where Muslims and Hindus thrive alike? Please, Mr. G, would you like to go first and then? Uh, I just want to say that the Gyanwapi case is already in the courts and the courts have uh, legally analyzed it and they have figured out that there is a worship already going on there by the Hindus. In fact, there is worship in the basement of the, of the mosque by the Hindus because there are Hindu deities still lying in there. And uh, I believe that both these cases will go through the legal process uh, as on an expedited way, and I think they will they will be resolved. Uh, I think the fact that the Ram Temple was resolved in an amicable manner gives hope to the people, it's because these two sites are also very important. Mm -hmm. And I do not foresee any uh, issues coming in the next couple of years for the resolution of this these two issues. And I do foresee there will be a proper amicable solution to this. Now. Uh, as an architect, you know, one of my one of the reasons why I became an advocacy person for Hindu rights is because of my training as an architect in India. And I remember growing up uh, when I used to do surveys uh, of historical monuments across central and northern India, something that I was never taught in history books. I actually read British authors from the 1800s and their reports on many of these historical places. And that's it boggled my mind to see literally the scale of destruction that happened all across uh, India. And that's therefore, you know, part of my resolve to understand these issues and focus on them at a global level was to 
from stemming from that background. And, you know, even when uh, after 9-11, uh, at the 9-11 site, there were, there were plans to build a huge mosque next to the 9-11 site. I actually volunteered my time to discuss and present on that issue, uh, you know, back then in 2006 and 7. Uh, so just to give you a perspective, I think things will be taken care of uh, through the law. And I think that would be a positive thing on Mathura and uh, Gyanwapi. Wonderful. Shandhari? Yeah. So there is a fundamental difference in uh, Mathura and Gyanwapi compared to Ayodhya. Because in uh, Kashi and Mathura both, there is a large temple already, right? And some part of the, the main part, the sanctum, sanctorum, so to say, is occupied by the, by the mosque, right? But in Ayodhya, there was nothing, right? Uh, the, 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 the main statue of Ramlala was in a tent. So the emotive issue in Ayodhya was far more bigger than in Kashi and Ayodhya, uh, in Kashi and Mathura. Having said that, I think responding to Charlotte, uh, I think the onus of coexistence and harmony should not lie singly in Hindus, always, right? In fact, I remember the story of Mahabharata when there was a fight between Kauravas and Pandavas and Krishna came on the behalf of Pandavas and he said, just give me five villages. I don't want this empire. Just give me five villages. And Duryodhan even refused five villages. And there was a, there was a proposal from Hindu side that give us Kashi, Mathura and Ayodhya amicably. And the, and the evidence is Evidence was like on the face, right? If you walk into the mosque, there are Hindu god and goddesses coming out of the mosque of the statue, which is almost like a not a proper proper mosque for them, right? And they fought a court case for that. They fought a we have to fight a court case to get a very blatantly Hindu side back, right? And now those five villages are not given by by, by Duryodhana, and then there was a big war. So that's one thing. This coexistence and harmony which should come from both the sides. The owners should not lie only on Hindus. Right. And as Utsav said, there was a documentation. That if, you, if you read these two volumes, right, Hindu temples, what happened to them by Sitaram Goenji, it mentioned like each and every detail. Even and it quoted Islamic text. It's not even a Hindu text. In Europe, negation is, is, a, is a crime. You can't say Holocaust never happened. But in India, you can just go away. Oh, no, this temple is broken. We don't know. The facts are not available. Right. So I think we have to be, we, we have to be stern about it. And, and owners only should not lie in Hindus. Anyone else like to respond to that? Well, I, I would just like to say that, you know, despite what other others may say to what I'm about to say, tolerance has always been in India. You know, it's in, and I'll give you a very, uh, I'll give you a very um, simple example. I, I had a friend who, uh, who's a Catholic and he is, uh, he's from a very, very prominent Catholic uh, community within India. And he said when he went to school, um, he went to a Catholic school and there were Hindu uh, classmates, Sikh classmates and, you know, Jain classmates as well. And every lunchtime, they, they, they all got together in, in this one table and shared a veg biryani together. Right. And, and that's, and, and, you know, look, that's you might say, well, you know, that happens in every other country. Well, again, but that really symbolizes the the place of the spirit of tolerance that has always been in India. Now, you can't expect every country, every civilization to be peaceful. There's always going to be communal violence here and there. But again, to to look at the entire civilization and say, well, you know, it, it's violence has always been in the center of it, I, it, it, which is something that the other side, got, quite unfortunately, is trying to uh, narrate right now. Anyway, it's, it's, it's totally wrong. And, you know, uh, but but I will say in, in, in on top of, just to add to what uh, Charlotte has said is that this uh, this concept of existing together within India has been a very very complex issue in in a very very good way um, in, in the sense that you know you'll you know in Kerala you you can't really walk down a street without seeing you know at least five churches in a in a single street right and you'll go to another uh, state and you'll you'll see um, you know mosques thriving here and there. And I, I was in, I was up in uh, Himachal Pradesh years ago, and you know, you'll you'll see Buddhist temples here, and you know, Hindu ashrams on on, on every corner. And and so, uh, despite the narr the the false narratives that's out there, we need to understand the realities of the ground in the sense that whatever happens, people have always learned to live together in India. And um, and, and again, I, I I agree with Shantu in, in the sense that you know, it's not. It's not the job of the. It's not only the job of the Hindus, but everyone already understood that, and they've been practicing it uh, for for thousands of years. And I think that's 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 something that we need to 
um, highlight continuously instead of just you know looking at the current problems or looking at listening to simply BBC and mm -hmm. and 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 you know concluding that you know India is right now a terrible place under PM Modi. By the way, a lot of these violence that that they've been referencing has been going on in, in, in pockets of these communities for a very, very long time right, since the other party was in, oh, was, was in power. So, so I don't think it's, it's fair to say it. I, I, if, if anything, it's very hypocritical. I think the media should have emphasized on what was a demonstration of coexistence. And I think coexistence did run both ways. At Ayodhya, I think there was a perfect demonstration of that when you saw 40 Muslim women making garments for Ram, you saw the Muslim tailor who made the, the huge flag. There were Muslim singers from Rajasthan that, that came down and talked about this as a moment for peace and reconciliation. Even the lead litigant, Muslim litigant for, for the mosque um, in the Supreme Court case, welcomed the judgment. And as Shantanu said, was there at the open so I, I, I think it's quite remarkable the healing that uh, there is a lot of healing yet to be done and there is a lot of uh, justice yet to be seen. But I do think it's remarkable the healing that has happened since partition, um, which was the one of the most violent periods with regards to death and numbers of deaths in, in human history. And this partition will have left and has left massive scars but the fact that these communities can coexist at all is absolutely remarkable and if you look at what's happening with israel and and palestine right now um i actually think it's something to be celebrated what we're seeing in india and yes there are pockets of issues there are problems and a, a lot of it is um actually within certain sections of the society whilst certain sections of the society are living in um, relative wealth, going to university, um, involved in in work, women in work. You know, you've got you've got to like how, how my my boss would describe it: the twenty first century India, and then um, you have the communities that are living in in relative poverty and that are less educated, and that's where you see a lot of the communal religious conflict. Um, so, if you look at the twenty first century India, you're really not seeing any of these problems at all. Yeah, you bring up an excellent point. And, and of course, we're, we're, we're kind of, I'm I want to wrap it up here soon, but I want to say, uh, I was going to ask about how this maybe relates to the Temple Mount, right? What's going on there? It's it's a little bit of a more intense situation. Uh, yes, I went there. It's quite, a long, it's quite a long answer, <laughs> <laughs> but I think the difference, there's a, this, there's a significant difference in that where, um, of course, the first temple was destroyed, the second temple was destroyed by conquering um, civilizations. You've had the Babylonians and then you had the Romans conquering Herod's second temple. Um, but the building of the mosque actually was after a period of which the temple was in relative rubble and disrepair. Um, and it was seen as a continuation of Abrahamic faith and significance at the time of its building. Obviously, now it's become to come to be more conflictual. Um, but it's interesting because there's an Abrahamic thread and a realization by all three in all three books this is an area of significance um making it religiously significant for all and religiously centric for all whereas the ram temple was religiously centric for hindus and the mosque was not it was as any other mosque was um, which makes it significantly different. And I do think it's an interesting case study. The ability, although terribly tense, and I have been there when Muslims haven't been allowed into uh, the Al-Aqsa Mosque complex and it can cause um, huge issues, but at the same time, all that's left of the temple is the wall. Um, and this is the most significant uh, place for, for Jews um, that there is total. So that is very complex and you have, but you have Jewish access to, to the wall, you have Muslim access to the mosque um, and you have a very difficult, regulated, tense coexistence within Jerusalem where all three faiths have access, but it is tense. I've seen people beating each other up. I've seen, yeah, uh, yeah. Absolutely. Um... Thank you for, we should definitely continue the conversation with that during a different time. I, I wanted to say, thank <laughs> you, so much, Charlotte. Uh, I wanted to say, does anyone else have any final remarks, closing remarks, because we are going to close down today's uh, wonderful discussion uh, and continue at a different time? Anyone? Yeah, uh, I think in the starting, you asked me, uh, all of us, in fact, what changed exactly on that day, right? 
Uh, I spent uh, three months in last year in Oxford. Uh, in fact, I came in December and I was doing a fellowship at Oxford. The class I was sitting had a cross inside the class. Uh, Oxford University has official church. Every 30 colleges of Oxford have a, has a chapel, has a chaplain, has a choir, and the, the services are written on the academic website of that college, right? Which is fine. They have a Christmas, the whole of the best of the Christmas holiday. They have an Easter holiday, right? They, they take oaths. The president and prime ministers take oath on a Bible. When I went to the House of Lords, I realized 22 positions are reserved for the Church of England, right? When I went to Washington, D.C. in 2022, I realized their presidents also, before taking the oath uh, on Bible, uh, go to a particular church in Washington, D.C. When I realized all of that, right? So the, the, the Western powers, which are teaching me secularism from all this time, right? They, they have their engagement with their religion is very different. And when I do this in my country, or my politics do this in my country, this oh my, how can how can Narendra Modi do this, right? And that's so 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 hypocritical, right? Uh, We're trying so, yeah, to move away to... from it, though. We're trying to move away. We're trying to, to reduce that. We've but been trying think, to secularize so, for a long time. Yeah, but it's not. It's it, like if, if you just walk into the streets of uh, uh, UK, any city, like any schools, schools have choir competitions. Like schools have every school, a college of UK mostly have a large church. Inside the campus, I believe inside they the college campuses, I believe college they campuses, should. right? And they have chaplains, and they have inside the part of the college culture, right? And if India will do it, they will say, "Oh, how can India do it, right?" And that's such a hypocritical engagement, right? I remember yeah, when yeah. after 2014 yeah. win, when Narendra Modi went to uh, Prayag, they say, "Oh my God, he is a Hindu prime minister." What about all the presidents and prime ministers in Western countries who take oath and Bible, right? So this engagement, so that's when the Overton window of India engaging with its own religion, right? It's become, will be very, very different after 27. And we will have, we'll be not, we will be, we were shamed. Oh, how can you be so Hindu? How can you put a tilak? How can you do this? How can you hold? And uh, sporting a cross chain is very common in UK, right? But putting a Hindu symbol, we were shamed all along. There is... That window has changed drastically that day. So that's I wanted to point, to, point that out. Go ahead. It's I just want to say that the, I think th that's why in the beginning of when I started saying I, there is a paradigm shift happening from of the Hindu identity, which is shifting to a post-colonial identity from a uh, uh, quasi-colonial identity. And the gaze of different actors towards that identity is going to be different. Those who do not like the Hindus uh, for their own reasons, whether it's the Islamists or the extreme left or whoever, they will find their reasons to exaggerate this shift of gaze. And that's what they're doing. That's why you have the Washington Post headlines. And there will be those who will who will be uncomfortable because they are not accustomed to that new identity, uh, post-colonial identity. And they will be uh, uh, uncomfortable. They may have concerns. They And those concerns would be right because it's very easy to derail uh, you know, when you're traveling fast and the consequences could be really bad. So the concerns will be there, but they will adjust and that's the challenge that we as a civilization, Hindu civilization, as me, somebody who is identifying with it and myself, will have to be very cautious and very uh, deliberate about so that we, you know, we don't, we don't derail ourselves in this pursuit. And that's where I think the challenge of a mature civilization lies in, you know, how, how maturely you can deal with this transition. And if history were any pointers, I think Hindus have made it through the past 3000, 4000 years of recorded history. I think, I think, in my opinion, I think we'll be doing okay coming forward. But we have to continue to have this conversation and constant self-introspection, I believe, that we are trying to do here. Say, say. So I thank you. Sehun? Yeah, so just just to wrap everything up, you know, uh, it, another, another reminder that I would like to put into everyone's mind is that everyone around India is celebrating because of this you know whether they they feel that it's uh they themselves they themselves are connected to the temple culturally religiously or what have you um but but really it's it's becoming a uh, a sign or a symbol of uh, the alternative that everyone else around uh, in southeast asia and east asia have been looking for right and 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 i and i will and i think it's something that we need to understand is that when countries like China has to do everything artificially or aggressively, India moves everything through 
in, in natural in a natural means right like you would always it's it's really um it's and it's a really fascinating case and even just go even with the uh, with the Ayodhya temple you know it's I, I it to me it goes it seems like it goes way beyond Hinduism it, it goes way beyond Hinduism in the sense that it's it's not only brought people together but it is in a sense however to look at it a a doorway to a, a new century right and and so um you know india economically is is growing and even a lot of these arab countries are looking towards india for economic partnership rather than their brother pakistan or or any other, any other country and and there's a reason for that and the reason is very simple they see that india has not only a great economic promise but but overall india is a is a place where um things are just possible right things are possible and no matter how messy it is it's one of the only nations where uh, its problems are transparent it's out there that's why a lot of times it, it it may look messy but that's why everything else works right um and and it's it's uh, it, and again and as somebody who's been observing this issue for for some time now you know back in 2014 i i did an event called uh, in, in my college called um india versus china india's prominence and i had a chinese american scholar come and and we actually we, we actually explained why it, the next century will be the india century everyone called us crazy but you know with uh, you know fast forward to today we with the with the opening of the ram ram temple and also at the same time uh, india's economic stance in the world and I, i i still project that india will may become the second largest economy in the world by the way by 2027 um it's it's something that will everybody will have to come to respect and i think that's one of the other reasons why uh, there's so much attack against every aspect about india hinduism is is a great aspect about india but you know like everything else you know it is it is it, it, it is a foundational source and it's it's what makes what we know as the greater india today um and and so if when you hear things Uh, from the BBC or even Washington Post by the way they they often times interview the same exact people by the way you, you look at who they quote from um you know just please uh, broaden your horizon and and see and really dig deeper into it i mean so that's even, right. if you're pointing that out i have to say you're right it is the same kind of analyst talking points and the same can be said for capital hill congressional hearings they hand pick who they choose to come and testify Uh, for specific issues so it is I actually, I actually heard that the older the more senior journalists the ones that are often often writing writing on these uh bigger stories and on india are ones that went and visited sort of 30 years ago and are in their senior later years and they're reporting using sources that they met then that have a very biased look at india now and that's really right. that's there is a problem with actually where the sourcing on the indian information is coming from also in the uk our political makeup demographic means that um it's often politically more advantageous to write a uh, biased news story away from hindus so if you're looking at the leicester unrest you see it was all quite muslim tilted even though the facts on the ground were very different so we have our own political reasons why the press is problematic Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you so much. I just wanted to say uh thank you to everyone, everyone for participating here. It's been an absolute pleasure and I look forward to seeing all of you again very soon. Clearly this is this this issue is is not going away. I expect that we're going to have many more conversations about this with much more context and maybe new details that will emerge uh that we can focus on more specifically. and i'm just uh thank you again to everyone from all over the world who took the time to be here with us this evening and looking forward to uh seeing you all very very soon please make sure that you um if you haven't already give give the gold institute a follow on twitter um it's at gold institute is which stands for international strategy so at gold institute is and i will look forward to seeing everyone here again very soon namaste Thank you. Awesome.